transitioned out giving his last message here at Rocky Hill. So let's welcome our beloved Pastor Christopher Scott. This is the book written to the believers in Philippi. And Paul was there. He, 
He helped start the church in Philippi on his second missionary journey. You can read about that in Acts 16, where Paul travels to the city of Philippi. He goes outside of the city. He meets these women that are gathered near this river. One of them is named Lydia, and he shares the gospel with them. These ladies accept the gospel, then they go back into the city, and they start the church in Philippi. Paul gets arrested like he did in a lot of places he went, and then he ends up getting out of prison and moves on, but that was the first church to be started in, in, um, in Europe, it was the church in Philippi. And he fast forward later on, Paul has continued traveling, he gets arrested, he's taken to Rome, and he's under house arrest in Rome, and while under house arrest in Rome, he writes four, we call them prison letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. And Philippians is one of those prison letters where he's literally under house arrest, awaiting trial before Nero, chained to a Roman soldier day and night, and he writes this letter back to the Philippians, telling them, continue to do good work, as we'll look at some, what some of that good work is. So the first part of the journey as a Christian that Paul describes is that we obey our spiritual leaders. Next, he tells us to work out our salvation, there at the end of verse 12. But how much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now this can be a perplexing comment there for us, work out your salvation. And that's true, um, it can be perplexing because as Protestant evangelical Christians, we've always been taught we're saved by faith, not by works. And that is true, salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. However, that salvation always leads to work. And Paul talks about the work and the results of their salvation here. Is there certain issues that are going on in their church? They have people that are coming into the church saying, you can do whatever you want and you're saved and it doesn't matter. And there's other people that come in a little later and say, oh no, you're saved by your faith. But you still have to do all these other things called the Judaizers. And then there's these people in the church that are having rivalries and disputes and they can't get along with each other. And Paul's trying to tell them, in light of being saved and what that means, you need to work out that salvation those issues. Workout means to do something as a result of what was done. You do it from a state of possession, or in other words, you have it, so this is what you do because of it. That's what workout means here and in this context, and we know that they're saved because he says in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul starts this letter to them, he says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. He calls them saints, holy ones, right there at the beginning. So he's saying, you're saved, but you need to work out your salvation. Those are two things that are bound together and tied up together that you cannot separate. It's kind of like in the movie Fireproof. If you've seen the movie Fireproof, it came out about 10 years ago with Kirk Cameron. And Kirk Cameron's this big, fancy um, chief of a fire department, and, uh, but his marriage is a wreck, and 90% of it is all his fault. So he's, luckily, he's got this one good Christian friend that talks to him a lot, his best friend. And they're sitting there at the kitchen table at the fire station. And Kirk Cameron's, you know, spilling his, his thoughts about his marriage and why it's a wreck. And his friend takes the salt and pepper. I always like that scene. He takes the salt and pepper and he glues them together. And Kirk Cameron starts to get all animated. Like, what are you doing? Now you ruined it and all that. And his friend says, marriage is two people coming together. And once they come together, you can't separate. And our salvation and good works are that same thing. Once we're saved, that's, that is good works come together too and cannot be separated. At the end of this verse, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, which deserves maybe a brief look. Fear and trembling. These words are not meant to scare us, but are meant to remind us how awesome God is and that we're privileged to be called sons and daughters in light of that. We're to work out our salvation. I like the Net Bible translates it. Work out your salvation with awe and reverence. Because we know we are already saved by faith through grace in Christ. But it's this awe and reverence for God that we do things on his behalf because of what he has done for us. But if we're supposed to work out our salvation, how do we do that? Luckily, Paul tells us in the very next verse, in verse 13, he says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. At the beginning of that verse, there's four, four words. For it is God. And this supplies the basis for how we act out our salvation. 
God does it all, but he puts us to work, too. In doing some study this week, I was reading that J. Vernon McGee, I'm not sure if you've heard of him, he still has his radio broadcasts, but he has these great little commentaries, and he comments on this verse in this, uh, saying this, So God works out that which he worked in. He has saved you. He saved you by faith, plus nothing. God is not accepting any kind of good works for salvation. But after you are saved, God talks to you about your works. The salvation that he worked in by faith is a salvation he will work out also. Calvin expressed it this way. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. God puts the will and the work in us, and God is the one literally energizing us to do those good things as part of our journey. Warren Brady says the Christian life is not a series of ups and downs. It's rather a process of ins and outs. God works in, and we work out. So the journey of the Christian means we obey our spiritual leaders, as the Philippians obeyed Paul. We work to show the results of our salvation, and we allow God to work in us. That's the journey that we are all on as Christians. But he also Paul talks about the job that we have to do as Christians in verses 14, 15, and 16. He says, a really short verse, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So the first job of a Christian is to have a good attitude. Do not grumble or not dispute. And grumbling is that utterance that we make, kind of that low tone of voice, so that thing we say under our, under our voice, our breath. Disputing is that verbal exchange where you go back and forth with someone and talk to them. But Paul says that you should do all things without that as a Christian. This verse, do all things without grumbling or complaining or disputing, that's the favorite verse of every manager and teacher and parent <laughs> and pastor. Oh, my name is so <laughs> is we all love this verse, but, but it's tough to do, okay? To not grumble and not dispute. And I had a, a pastor friend I had in Texas he worked at, he was a youth pastor at a large church, and I, he had a good, healthy youth ministry. And so I asked him, I said, how do you recruit leaders to do all your youth ministry? And he said, Christopher, this is what I do. I go to all these other ministries going on in our church, and I know people aren't happy, I know they're grumbling and complaining and not happy. And I ask them if they'll come work for me. And if they say no, I know they're happy. But most people are unhappy, so then they come and they work for me. This is grumbling and disputing that's going on. Not sure that's the best way to always go about <laughs> keeping friendly with your coworkers, but that's what he would do. He knew this is grumbling and disputing. But the good thing, the good news for you sitting here today, most of you are paid to work within the church. You get to volunteer, so you get to choose where you want to work. You get to find that place that you're passionate about. Maybe it's uh, serving coffee or being a greeter in hospitality. Maybe you like to study the Bible, so you want to facilitate a small group. Maybe you love kids, so you get to work with kids. There's even some people, they like to clean. These people really exist. In their free time, they will come to church. And they will clean. I have no doubt. So, that's the, the joy. If you're not working for a church, you can find an area you like to do. You don't have to grow and complain about it, okay? So, part of our job as Christians is to do ministry without grumbling or complaining. And there is a purpose in doing this. Verse 15, let me read verse 14 again. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. So that's kind of a long verse, so let's put it in half. The, per the second job of a Christian that he talks about here is that pro Christians prove themselves to be blameless and innocent among the generation. Now, we know that we are blameless spiritually because we are saved, but we need to prove that blamelessness to the world and show it to the world. When he talks about blameless, it relates to this solid and righteous conduct. Innocent means we are literally unmixed and pure. A little farther down in the verse here, he says, children of God above reproach. And when he says that, it means without fault and therefore morally blameless. 
And this is a, a term that Paul uses regularly to talk about us, and I think it's good to show you. I mentioned Paul wrote four letters from prison, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philippians. So if you go back one book to Ephesians, he uses the same word above reproach to talk about the Ephesians. In chapter 1, verse 4 of Ephesians, Paul says that us as believers, it says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. Okay? Then if you go over to 527, Ephesians 527, he uses that same word again. It's talking about how God gave His life for the church to hold, to cleanse the church and make her holy. Says that he might present himself, that's Christ, to the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she would be holy and blameless. Because of what Christ has done, because he's died for us, we are holy and blameless and without and above reproach. Then if you go over to Colossians 1.22, again, these are three letters that we're reading today that he wrote, probably sitting in the same spot, writing these letters back to believers in different areas. He says in here, 122, this is my favorite, Colossians 122. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. What a blessing that is that we get to know we are holy and blameless beyond reproach. We have this job we're given where we have to prove it to the generation around us and the world. Okay. In this verse in, in 15, um, the picture of the Christian is strongly contrasted with the community that the Philippians are living in described uh, here. If we go back to Philippians 2.15, he says, You are children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. When he says crooked and perverse, the Greek word for crooked there is skolios, which sounds like Scoliosis, which means bent or curved. And it's contrasted against these other words we've been looking at, which mean morally upright and straight. So the whole world and generations are crooked and perverse and twisted, but as Christians, we're supposed to be morally upright and straight. We're supposed to depart from the accepted standard of the culture and live up to the Christian values. Now, this doesn't mean that as Christians, we're supposed to just wave our white flag, give up, and totally depart from culture. We still have to work places, we still have to have family and friends and neighbors, so we need to be careful as we engage in our community to still shine brightly for Christ, as we're going to talk about in this next verse here. Or at the end of 15, it's a long verse, I broke it in half. It says at the end of 15, among you whom you appear as lights in the world. Now, among that crooked and perverse generation we talked about, we should appear as lights in the world. And as I read those stories to you, the introduction of, from the newspaper, it's not very hard to look different than them, honestly. It's not, it's not very hard to see where they're at and we, where we as Christians should be. The idea Paul is explaining here is to shine or produce light is to shine like a luminary in the sky or a star. The only other place that he... Um, in the New Testament, it talks about shining bright. The same word is used in Revelation 21, 11, where the New Jerusalem comes down and there's this magnificent, brilliant, bright light. It's the same word used there. Okay? So we need to shine bright among the darkness, among the generation that we're in. Here's some ways that we can shine brightly in the darkness, just to give you some practical ways how we start to do this. Every time you eat lunch or you eat a meal around other people, it's okay. Take a minute and pray for your meal. It shows other people that you are grateful that God has provided that meal to you. Maybe you're around some friends or classmates or coworkers that start to gossip, and you decide to politely excuse yourself from that conversation. Maybe you're talking to someone that's really struggling and going through some tough stuff. Whether they're a Christian or not doesn't matter. Take a minute there and pray for them in that moment, in person or even over the phone. Don't say, I'll pray for you, and then take off. Ask them, you got two minutes? Let's pray together for them. Or, you can even be, this is my role a lot of times, 
a designated driver since for some friends that like to enjoy alcohol. That was my role for in college. I was always the, the, the driver, which is okay, you know. It was a, a way to look a little different, and people always appreciated it, you know. So, all right. So the potential to shine is easy, but it's hard work for several reasons. Number one, it doesn't come naturally. We have this sin nature that tends to pull us away from shining brightly in our generation. Second, you got to do the opposite of everyone else. So it's hard to, to look different and be different. Third, there is a cost, sometimes financially, socially, with your time, things like that. So the last comment that Paul makes here, verse 16, the job of Christians is to hold fast to the word of life. He says in 16, here, let me read it for us. Verse 16, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. Okay? So it's time for a pastor confession. I love the Bible, I love to read the Bible, I love the New American Standard Bible, but there are times I read it, and I don't know what it is saying. <laughs> so here, holding fast to the word of life. What does that mean? So as I studied a little bit and looked at this, there's two ideas or two opinions that we can take this to mean as Christians in our job. One is we hold fast to it, we hold on to it, and we've been given this gift of salvation, we hold on to it and use it in our life. That's one way. Another way is holding forth. You hold it out, and that is the way you shine bright by sharing the gospel, evangelizing, and telling other people about Christ. So those are the two opinions. So thus far, we looked at the journey of a Christian and what that means. We looked at the job of a Christian and those four things that we just covered in those three verses. Lastly, Paul talks about the joy of a Christian in verses 17 and 18. He says, verse 17, But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you. So the joy as a Christian here that we have, Christians and spiritual leaders share their joy with each other. Here we see the spiritual leader Paul sharing his joy with his spiritual children, the believers in Philippi. And again, these people first heard the gospel from Paul. He was their spiritual father and helped them start the church. And this letter back to the Philippians was a response to several um, gifts that they had sent to Paul to take care of him while he was under house arrest in prison. They sent these gifts to take care of him. And this has been called by one person, uh, the book of Philippians, the most spontaneous and intimate of Paul's letters. And we see that here when he shares his joy with them. And as, you're, as a uh, pastor that's worked here for four years, you probably weren't surprised to see I chose Philippians to talk on Thanksgiving weekend. It's the letter of joy, we all know that. But I wanted to pick a passage where I could get to share some of my joy with you uh, being here and serving here for four years as a small groups pastor and associate pastor. And I just want to tell you it's been an honor and a privilege to get to serve with you. I am grateful for you all. Could not have asked for a nicer group of people to do ministry with. And I get to think of um, all the, the things and ministries we did and small groups and divorce care ministry and grief support and recovery ministry. We did men's ministry, all kinds of fun men's events and new believers. And I just want you to know how how much joy I've had the past couple of years doing that with you here. And I, I thank you for that. Because I didn't, I didn't get like this when I practiced. So <laughs> every time I, I practiced it word for word twice. I never got like this. You all have accepted. We love you. Yeah, love you too. <laughs> Y'all have accepted my wife and my son as soon as we got here to be one of your own for Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's celebrations and taking care of us. So, so thank you for that. Christians are supposed to share their joy 
amongst each other. It's not just joy between you know, people of the church and the spiritual leader, as in Paul and Philippians. It's supposed to be among the Christians together, part of the church. So that's verse 18 here. Paul says, You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. So we see these words rejoice and rejoice used again. We see joy and rejoice used four times in these brief two verses. And we see those words used 16 times in just four short chapters of Philippians. Philippians is the letter about joy. And he uses two different words to talk about joy here. One is Cairo, which means be glad and rejoice. The other one means is soon Cairo. He changes it in the beginning. He adds a preposition on the beginning, the preposition soon, which means with. Literally, rejoice with other people. You're supposed to enjoy your joy and rejoice with other people. And what's even more surprising is how he uses joy in this letter. He talks in chapter 1, uh, he talks about chapter 1, how he's in prison like I told you. Uh, yeah, let's start over. What's even more surprising is how often it is used and how it is based on the circumstances of people. In Philippians chapter 118, Paul's talking about how he's in prison, but how he still shares the gospel. So he rejoices in that. He's got a, a soldier chaining him day and night, and he rejoices in that. In another place, in chapter 2, this is a really big one, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, Paul says to rejoice when Epaphroditus shows up, because Epaphroditus, quote, came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life. And he almost died. You should be happy. You got to do this for Christ. And I share that with you because if Paul, sitting in prison, chained to a Roman soldier, can be happy and rejoice, I think we too can find joy in our circumstances. But that might be something you're struggling with, with joy. So I have a few things that I think can help you be more joyful. Number one, start a journal and start to just write. Pen and paper and just start a journal. I have a journal that I've kept for a long time. And at the front of my journal, I keep a list of God's evidence in my life. Just things I've seen God do in my life. And I write them down as they come up. And when I'm struggling, I open that journal and I look to that list. At the back of it, I keep a list of, this is really deep, nice things people have done for me. That's as extends it. Just if someone sends me a nice card, they deliver a meal or whatever it might be, I just jot it down there. Because when you're struggling and not feeling joyful, I can open that and I look at this big long list of all the nice things. So one way to be more joyful is to keep a journal. Another one, go outside and go for a walk. Just simply being in sunshine has all kinds of physiological things that go on that I don't always understand, but I know it's work, or it works. So go outside and go for a walk and go with someone else if you can as well. Spend time with others is the third way to be more joyful. Make sure you're in fellowship and talking to people, and make sure you have one or two really good friends that you engage with. For me, I have a guy I've known since I was a freshman in college. Um, he lives in Santa Clara, we talk on the phone all the time. His dad lives in Visalia, so just Friday at seven o'clock at night, we're both sitting outside Starbucks shivering, <laughs> but we're there because we're friends, and that's important, and that's my, you know, one of my two deep, close friends, because he was in town. He comes to town a couple times a year, and I didn't want to miss that opportunity Another friend I have is a pastor in Nebraska. We talk on Skype every Tuesday in the afternoon just to check out. The last tip I have for you to be more joyful is to have a hobby. Have a hobby. I want to give you permission to have a hobby, if that's okay. Because it, and a lot of times we're too busy, got too much going on, too many things happening. It's okay to simply just have fun. There's a couple in our church, I won't say their names, but... Um, he likes to golf, and so the wife has told me in the past, you know, when he's starting to get kind of grumpy, I just tell him, go play golf. And he comes back, and he's happy again. It's good, right? So it's okay to have a hobby. So as we close out our time together, I want to ask you three questions that will wrap up this message for us. Three questions that will wrap up this message. Three questions that help you live lightly. 
Do I need to accept Christ as my Savior? Number one. Do I need to accept Christ as my Savior? We've seen in this passage that we're saved by God. He does a work in us because we've been, you know, we have accepted salvation by faith and grace. If we're going to live lightly, we first need to make sure we've accepted Christ as our Savior. Number two, do I need to get involved in ministry? Do I need to get involved in ministry? God puts desires in us to do good work, and it's on us to look for some of those opportunities and start to do that good work and show that proof of our salvation to work out our salvation. So three questions. One, do I need to accept Christ as my Savior? Do I need to get involved in ministry? Do I need to share more joy with more people? We've seen that Paul is joyful even when he was under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier day and night. We need to cultivate more joy and share that with people. Now, the closing illustration I came across this week, I heard the story and I, I transcribed it because I thought it, it really describes what does it mean for us to shine bright in our dark world. Let me read it to you. The scriptures are what helped me cling to Christ when I went into the Marine Corps. I found myself 8,000 miles away from home, living with 60 other Marines on the island of Okinawa. 97% of them either had had or currently had venereal disease. There was a prostitute on virtually every corner. 5,000 of them were moved in by the United States government, and they were there to service the Marines. This was the world I lived in, though I was married and my wife was back home. I was over there and remember thinking, if I don't stay true to the scriptures, I'm going to be in that village with one of those prostitutes. By the grace of God and because of the work of the navigators and the faithfulness of a man who loved me and saw potential in me, which I didn't see myself, he took this young Marine under his arm, under his wings, and built into me a love, a deeper love for the scriptures and for the memorized word, for the practical applied word. I knew that if I'm going to survive, I'm going to stay true to God's word. If you've ever worked with the navigators, you know that years ago they had a verse pack that you use to memorize verses out of There were very little tiny cards, and I'd been on the island about three months then. I had a folk mate that showed up named Eddie. Eddie was from New Orleans. He found out that I was a Christian, and he said, I don't want to tell you something, bud. Don't lay that trip on me. Don't come over here with, I didn't come over here to be evangelized, okay? I said, that's okay, it's no problem. Eddie said, you just lay off, bud, okay? All these guys tell me you're a preacher. I responded, I'm not a preacher. I'm just in this outfit. Eddie responded again, okay, I'm not interested. You got that, bud? I said, yeah. So I lay on my top bunk and I figure out, now Lord, how can I get this guy in any way interested? So I said to him one day, hey Eddie, can you help me with some of these words? He said, he said, I don't want you to lay that chip on me. I said, no, I just want you to help me with some of these verse cards. So I dropped down about 40 of those verse cards on them, and I said, let's see if I can do these. And they were like John 3.16, 1 John 5.11, you know, the ones you can do backwards at night and in your sleep. After a few weeks of doing this, it got to where Eddie would say, hey, are we going to go over all those religious words tonight? So then, fast forward 25 or 30 years, and my phone rang, and on the other end of the line, I heard this voice. Hey, bud! I thought, this can only be Ed. He said, hey, you know that trick you played on me in Okinawa? <laughs> I responded, yeah? And he said, hey man, it worked, because I'm loving Jesus. Yeah. 8,000 miles away among a bunch of prostitutes and Marines that wanted nothing to do with God and had zero interest in Him. That regular, everyday guy shined bright for Christ in the monks, his generation there. And I hope that you too, for whatever circumstance you're in, you can shine bright in the dark world. You need to accept Christ as your Savior? That first question. 
you need to get involved in ministry, you need to share your joy with others. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this amazing church um, that I've gotten to minister and do, to minister to and do ministry with. Thank you for them being so kind and welcoming. And we thank you um, for the, the privilege we have to gather to open your word and study. And as these people go about their, their week and the month of December, I pray that you will help them shine brightly for Christ. Shine brightly for you among their family, friends, neighbors, whatever that might look like. Even though it will be difficult and hard and, and not fun, pray that you would strengthen them. That as this passage says, you will put the will and desire inside of them 